Hi class, I wanted to provide a supplemental resource about the work of Morgan's lab uh, with fruit flies. This is the next chapter of genetics. Remember, Mendel did some work with peas in uh, the 1800s, around 1850 to 1860. A lot of his work wasn't actually uh, read and observed until about 30 or 40 years after his death, uh, around the late 1800s, early 1900s. So the work of Mendel uh, becomes recognized uh, around 1900, and along comes Morgan's geneticist uh, work uh, in 1907 and beyond. Morgan worked with fruit flies. Fruit flies represent a model organism in biology for a number of reasons. <clears throat> They're small, they reproduce quickly, you can grow a uh, population of offspring in about three weeks and then um, interbreed them and have the next generation so in the course of a, a college semester or a year, you can have a lot of generations. Remember, when you're looking at studies of like natural selection and evolution and artificial selection, having a frequent rapid generation time is a good thing. You can see how the shift in frequencies in the gene pools occurs and so forth. Uh, another thing that uh, makes fruit flies a, a great model organism is that they only have four sets of chromosomes. So 2n equals 8, uh, 8 overall chromosomes, 4 sets. Uh, they have three autosomal body uh, style chromosomes and then the XY chromosome making up the fourth pair. Uh, <clears throat> so when you're looking for like where genes might be located on a particular chromosome, you don't have to look in too many places. All right, so um, Morgan spent about two years crossing fruit flies without uh, much avail. And then he finally came across what you see here uh, was a mutant version of eye color to the right, the albino or the white eye color on the right. Uh, this work uh, actually led him to start to determine that there were genes on the XY chromosome, uh, but that's not the story we're going to follow in this particular supplemental resource. Anyways, the normal wild type uh, fruit fly uh, appears on the left, and so they, they call that the wild type, and it's uh, abbreviated with a plus symbol next to a particular allele, and the mutant shown on the right. Now, let's reflect back to the work of Mendel for a minute. Mendel was fortunate or at least what he published was, um, was about the types of traits that made very conspicuous observations. Mendel was fortunate because the traits that he observed were on separate chromosomes, and so they followed the, the pattern of independent assortment and the laws of segregation, and they made really cool numeric patterns in the offspring. So when you observe two traits simultaneously, here we have a cross between two heterozygous parents for the seed color and the seed shape. And so you list all the possible outcomes for the sperm and eggs at the outcome of meiosis uh, across the top and across the, the side of the 16 box Punnett square. And then you fill in the square and you get uh, this cool ratio 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. Now, <clears throat> when, uh, if you do another cross, uh, this time but we, we call this a test cross. It's between, on the left, a heterozygote parent for both genes of interest. And on the right, you have a homozygous recessive uh, parent. And so the neat thing about a test cross is that you get very conspicuous haves and have-nots. <clears throat> um, either you have uh, the dominant phenotype expressed or you don't, and you show the recessive phenotype. Now, you could do this as a 16-box Punnett square, but note that the eggs from the homozygous recessive plant would all be identical, little y, little r. And so it's simplified to a single row because uh, if you did the 16 box square, you would get identical columns of outcomes. When you add up the math, you get a 1 to 1 to 1 to 1 ratio. And you notice if you look closely, you're going to have one group that's going to show the dominant trait for both uh, genes, seed color and seed shape. And then you have a dominant for seed color, and then you have a dominant for seed shape, and then you have homozygous recessive completely. Uh, so a really neat one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one -to -one ratio. And so this is, again, called the test cross. That's when you cross a heterozygote parent with a homozygous recessive. And uh, geneticists use this strategy a lot of times to determine a way that the genes are conveyed and passed on to the offspring follow certain rules. And if you don't see the normal pattern, then you can come up with a particular hypothesis about how the particular traits are being passed on. So here's a test cross from Morgan's lab. They used a wild type heterozygous fruit fly crossed with a 
double mutant. So the mutant is the, uh, the other color body shape and also the other wing style, vestigial wings. Vestigial wings are those kind of curly, stubby little wings. Actually pretty cool to use uh, flies with vestigial wings in a lab. So you can imagine when fruit flies escape, they bug you. They fly around all the time in your lab. And so the vestigial wings are grounded. They can't fly. And so if they get away from you, they just crawl away and then you can scoop them back up. So vestigial wings is a, a common trait used uh, out of convenience as well in genetic crosses. <clears throat> well, uh, Morgan started by the hybrid or the heterozygous variety from that first parental cross. And then he took that F1 outcome, which is heterozygous for both uh, traits, and crossed it back with a homozygous recessive, a double mutant. Um, <clears throat> and that test cross produced some very unique results, not what Morgan was expecting. This did not follow the normal Mendelian genetics. And so it got them curious, why? You know, if they were on different genes, or I'm sorry, on different chromosomes, like Mendel, um, Mendel's studies showed with the P uh, traits, you would expect a one to one to one to one ratio from a test cross from a 16 box Punnett square. But he didn't get that. They got 965 and 944 looking like uh, each of the parents. And only a few of those what are called the recombinants where they're switching some of the traits like the wing shape crossed uh, or switching with the body color. <clears throat> and so uh, as um, happens a lot when you when you receive really strange data in a lab, Morgan and um, his colleagues worked backwards trying to figure out, well, what could explain this? This is a curiosity. And so they thought, well, maybe the genes aren't on separate chromosomes. Maybe you're on the same chromosome. But if that were the answer, you would have gotten a one to one to zero to zero ratio because uh, the genes would hitchhike together. You know, they'd be packaged together on the same chromosome. Wherever that chromosome went, the offspring would get it. And that wasn't happening here. So uh, one of Morgan's colleagues <coughs> uh, proposed that maybe there's some DNA being swapped during meiosis. They could see this under the microscope that the DNA lined up very closely, but you couldn't actually see them physically cross over. Uh, and so the, the crossing over is illustrated here where you see the slightly different shades of red. And also if you notice that the uh, alleles of those particular genes are flip-flopping. And so uh, we took this for granted when we made our meiosis clay animation stop motion videos when we did the crossing over. And so Morgan's lab was the first to come up with experiment evidence supporting crossing over and the effect on the recombinant chromosomes and how that's passed on to offspring. <clears throat> so here looking a little closer, we have the parental chromosomes, the ones that look just like the, uh, the chromosomes of either parent. And then we have the recombinant chromosomes uh, at, at the outcome of meiosis one and uh, as they're separated and, and passed on to the gametes. Well, back to the effect of this on <clears throat> um, Morgan's test cross. Notice at the top, the female eggs, uh, all four possibilities are shown at the outcome of meiosis, and then the sperm of the homozygous res recessive male on the left. And so when you take a look at it in light of crossing over, this makes sense that you have some recombinants, the 206 and the 185. And so here, uh, you can see the effect of the recombinant chromosomes and the number of the recombinant offspring. <clears throat> and so Morgan and his colleagues came up with something called the recombination frequency. Uh, we have 391 recombinants over the total. So in their experiment, they had 2,300 total offspring they counted. And so they found out that 17% uh, came from these two uh, recombinant offspring uh, styles. This is from page 245 in our textbook. And again, if you're looking for like a, a four or five on the AP exam, uh, if you can understand this graphic, if you can if you can describe the test cross that Morgan did, and give rationale to the results that they got and how they calculate recombination frequency, then you're going to be in a good position. <clears throat> well, what what next? So Morgan and his colleagues came up uh, use these recombination frequencies to to propose the distances that these genes are on a particular chromosome. They rationalized that uh, if the recombination frequency between two genes is really small, then those genes must be closely oriented on the chromosome. 
and that there is statistically less chance for uh, crossing over to occur between the two genes. If the recombination frequency is really large, like 30 or 40 percent, then that means that those, chromo those genes were farther apart on the same chromosome, and that recombination or the crossing over event happened uh, more frequently uh, between the two genes. And so the recombination frequencies gives us basically map distances. And so they uh, started comparing other particular genes of interest that they knew were on the same chromosome. Here we have uh, B for the body color, black is a mutant. Uh, CN means cinnabar, so it's kind of a cinnamon color eye with a bar shape, and VG vestigial wings. And so um, in comparing the different frequencies, they're able to start mapping relative locations from each other. Uh, here are some more uh, phenotypes, wild type and mutant phenotypes that they mapped out on the same chromosome. So let's try one of these. It's like a logic problem. I've actually seen these show up on the ACT exam as well. Uh, so it's not just uh, isolated to a biology test. Uh, kind of fun. Um, kind of like working through a crossword puzzle. Imagine we're going to call our genes the green gene, the red gene, the black gene, the blue gene, and so forth. These are all on the same chromosome. And so how um, do they line up next to each other? Pause the video and see if you can work this out. All right, so first I'm going to just draw off a uh, like a segment of a chromosome. So I noticed that black to green are really far apart, so I'm gonna assume that they might be the farthest apart here. I'm gonna call that one of them black. And this other one over here is green, and they're 53 apart. Now I could look over uh, here, green to red. They're 28 apart. My choices are, I'm sure I put red over here, or over here. And so I'm gonna look for some other contextual clues in the data to help me determine which side I should place red. All right, so I notice that black to red is 25. So if red was out here, that would be greater than 53 from black to red, so that can't be. So I'm gonna to have to place the red one in here somewhere, about 25 in. Well, it's about halfway, a little bit less than halfway uh, between the black and green. So I'm gonna put red here. And I would say between red and green, I had uh, 28. All right, so now from black to blue, it's 33. Blue could be over here. Uh, but I also know red to blue is eight, so blue could be over here. Um, and so let's see here, black to blue is 33. So what's the difference between black and red? Well, 53 minus 28, Black to blue is 33, it's greater than 25, it must be over here somewhere. So I'm gonna call this one the blue. And uh, between black and blue, um, it is 33. All right, so I've got one, two, three, four genes. One, two, three, four genes. And I've mapped them all out. So there you have it. Um, let's take a look at the final answer here. All right, we got it. We got it correct. Nice work. I want to point out one other strategy with that's uh, shown on textbook page 246, and this is using the chi-square test to help determine the mode of genetic inheritance. <clears throat> this is actually modeled as the last problem in our mastering biology study. Um, guide for this particular topic. And I've uh, labeled it as extra credit. So this is one of those, like if you're looking to get a five on the AP exam, then you would want to know how to, or want to be able to develop the skill of using chi-square tests for more complicated genetics problems. <clears throat> as you read through it, it talks about a test cross between a plant with a, capital A, little a, capital B, little b, and um, the, the homozygous recessive. And so if you did a four by four Punnett square, you're, when you do a test cross again, you're expecting a one to one to one to one uh, ratio of the offspring. If you're expecting that, what are the actual numbers? And so how many actual physical offspring should you get? So, well, this would be one fourth of this particular trait and the total offspring that they uh, used or they counted were 900. So how do you get the expected here? Well, you would take one fourth of 900. And then we would repeat that uh, with each of these. So uh, 225 
225, 225, etc. Now here are the observed. They got 220, 210, 231, 239. Question is, is this close enough or is it significantly different than the expected? So <laughs> if the genes are on different chromosomes, th these are the values we'd expect. If the genes are on the same chromosome, then it would deviate from that, and the chi-square will tell us the answer to that. So we do a chi-square, you put in the expected, that's 225 for each of those outcomes, and you would fill 225 in repetitively down the list, and then you're going to uh, do your observed minus expected, so 220 minus 225, that's a difference of 5, and then 5 squared is 25, And then um, you take the uh, 25 divided by the expected of 225, and you fill in that uh, value here. Sum up all your values to get the overall chi-square. Remember, there's four classes of data here, four possible outcomes. So your degrees of freedom is going to be 4 minus 1. And <clears throat> so you're going to have three degrees of freedom. And you're going to then look at the chi-square chart um, and determine uh, p equals 0.05, does the chi-square value uh, exceed or not? And so if you read through uh, the text a little closer, it walks you through those details. Go ahead and try it on the extra credit on the Mastering Biology. There, there you're going to do some little drag and drop, and they're going to give you some hints if you get stuck and so forth as well. Great. Well, thanks for listening. Uh, please shoot me any questions you might have, either by email or dropping into the uh, class office hours.